Hello. I've been invited to prepare and record uh, a short provocation uh, in relation to questions of uh, ethics and, and morals in teaching, uh, which is an interesting challenge to do because uh, what is provocative for some may be outrageous for others and quite innocent for uh, against others. So uh, I have prepared some thoughts and I hope that they will help with stimulating some discussion and maybe also getting some precision in the discussion. I will provoke with two statements that teaching is not a moral profession and that an ethical teacher is not a good teacher. And what I'll try to do is to explain what I have in mind with those two statements and why I think they can be helpful. So to begin with the first one, an ethical teacher is not a good teacher. Um, it is a provocation, and if I try to be a bit more precise, the point I would like to make here is that an ethical teacher, a teacher who behaves ethically or, or morally correct, is not automatically or necessarily also a good teacher. And there is quite a simple argument for that, where you can say a baker can be ethical, but can still bake awful bread. A plumber can be ethical, but may not be able to fix a leak. A doctor can be ethical, but they may not be a skillful clinician. So you can see already where this uh, is going, that it's important, and that's one of the main points I want to make, uh, to, to see and understand that there is a difference between the, the ethical good, you can say the question of which actions are right or wrong, and what I call here the good of a trade or the good of a profession, which has to do with that, what the trade or profession is about. So if for the moment we stick to the example of baking, which I think is a helpful example, it's important to see that there is a difference between baking ethically and baking well. And you can say, what is a good baker? It is someone who bakes well, who not just knows how to bake well, but is actually able to bake well. And for bakers, that has to do with the quality of what is baked, the quality of the product. Is it tasty, healthy, nourishing, visually attractive? All kind of qualities that we can apply to the, the product that the baker bakes. And based on a judgment about that, we can say, yes, this baker is able to bake well. An ethical baker is someone who is concerned, for example, about using sustainable ingredients. Uh, or sustainably uh, sourced or sustainably grown ingredients. Is a baker who pays their employees well, is a baker who doesn't overcharge clients, is a baker who doesn't use misleading advertising. Those you can say are all qualities that say something about how ethical a baker is. But the point is that even the baker who bakes pays the employees well, uses sustainable ingredients, doesn't overcharge clients, doesn't mislead in advertising. We still don't know whether that baker will be able to bake well. So the two are really, you can say, disconnected. Nonetheless, they are both important questions, but they are different questions. Um, now, when we look for a moment at the the ethical side of it, you can say there is general ethics and special ethics. General ethics has to do with values that you can say that matter in, in all situations. Although what we what we believe that that matters and should matters in, in all should matter in all situations, that will shift over time. 
Um, and you can think of, of fairly mundane values that maybe have something to do there. That we try to be polite in human interaction, respectful, honest, that we act with integrity, that we have a concern for equality, uh, for non-discrimination. Nowadays, we would say in, in, in acting well, we talk about sustainability and democracy and, and inclusion, for example. And then you can say, in addition to these values, that would probably apply to all bakers, all teachers, all plumbers, all doctors in some way. There is special ethics, and these are values that matter because of the specific character of a trade or profession. And these are quite situated. So even when we think again about the, the special ethics of, of baking, the bakers who just bake, who stay near the oven, probably need a slightly different set of values than the bakers who also work in the shop, meet with customers, uh, do all the work there. Um, all this is not really sort of uh, radical or, or, or world shattering. It's, um, you can say these values are important. Uh, they play a role in, in the, the professions and the trades. They can stay implicit, but sometimes there's a need to make them explicit. Um, sometimes a need to make them very explicit and then we enter the domain of ethical codes. Uh, if we have ethical codes, then you can say we also need a system to make sure that everyone behaves according to the values in the code. And that can even become a matter of, of entry and exit uh, into or out of a, a trade or profession. But you can say all of these values have nothing to do with the, the good of the trade or of, of the profession itself. Um, and that is linked to my other statements. And, and these two statements are of course connected which is the reason why I'm saying that teaching is not a moral profession. The reason why I'm saying that, and, and you, you need to understand this in, in a quite precise way, is not that I'm saying that morality and ethics don't matter for teaching, but that if we want to find out what is distinctive about teaching, we cannot say, that that lies in ethics or morality. Um, so again, that's not to say that there are no normative questions in education and teaching, but for me, that would be a reason to use uh, a rather different phrase to say teaching is not a moral profession, but teaching is a normative profession. And I rely, for example, with that phrase on work done uh, by a colleague in the Netherlands, Harry Kahneman, and, and colleagues um, who, who have done a lot of work in figuring out what the normative profession is and what the normativity of professions themselves actually mean. To say that teaching is a normative profession makes another really important distinction, namely to distinguish it from technical professions. And this is an important issue for education because I think that what surrounds education all the time is a kind of, what is it? A desire to say, oh, education is so messy and so complicated, but with more research, more direction, more techniques, we can really make education into a, a technical profession where we can be much more certain about the, the outcomes that we want to achieve. That for me is worrying and in a minute I'll say a bit more about why I think that that's a, a mistaken understanding of what teaching is about. But I see uh, many dimensions of this way of thinking. I know people who talk about teaching and say, what's teaching? Well, teaching that is about interventions that are supposed to produce particular learning outcomes. And for me, 
that language of intervention and learning outcomes is a technical language that doesn't really suit what teaching is about. For me, this is also the problem we're talking about effectiveness, that teaching should be effective, that teachers should do uh, what works and, and nothing else in, according to some or in some countries. I think the, the technical view of teaching is also promoted by all the measurement around education that tries to look very carefully at what goes in and what comes out. And again, you look at, at teaching in a, in a machine-like way. Um, I see it in, in people who talk about teaching in, in causal ways or, or think that there is some kind of causality between what teachers do and, and what happens on the side of students. And I would even say, but this is a short provocation, and I, I hope there will be opportunity to look at the detail. Even the language of learning for me runs the risk of, of pushing teaching too much towards a, a technical uh, understanding. So coming back then to this question of the good of a profession or the, the good of a trade, you can say what we're talking about there are not ethical questions, but they have to do with the question what the trade or profession is for or what the trade or profession is about. Um, so you can say that the trade of, of baking is there in order to, to bake and to make food available. That's what the trade is for, but you can also say that's what the profession or the trade, maybe we can call bakers, even professionals, what, what it is about. There is an, a nice Greek word that is sometimes used here, the word telos. Um, and you can say the good of the trade or the profession has to do with the, the telos of that particular trade, profession, or practice. In English, we could say this is the purpose of the trade or the profession, the purpose of baking, the purpose of teaching. And that's fine. I think the question of purpose is, is not often enough asked in education. So it's already a step forward to say we need to engage with the question of the purpose of what we do. But there is always a risk, again, technicism is never far away, that the purpose is defined as the outcome and that before we know it, even if we have worthy purposes, that we're back into technical questions about how can we produce those outcomes. So we should be mindful of that uh, risk, you could say. A better way maybe to talk about this is to say what we're looking for is what the point of a trade of a, or a profession is. Why the trade or profession exists, what it is about, what, what the point of it is. And then you can say good baking, the good of baking must be orientated towards the point of baking, which is, for example, about providing food, nourishing food, which also means that good teaching is in some way orientated towards the point of education. Now, in the final few steps, I want to bring in um, a philosopher from long ago who I think still has an awful lot to say here that's really helpful. And the philosopher is Aristotle, a philosopher, but also a, a biologist, um, someone interested in the world of, of change and, and development. You can say Aristotle is really interested in, in human life and human world. And that's why I find him so interesting, unlike some other philosophers who are just interested in ideas and, and thinking outside of this world. Now, one thing that you can say with Aristotle about baking and teaching 
Baking and teaching are human endeavors. And that sounds obvious, but it's really important not to forget this. Because to say that they are human endeavors means in the language of Aristotle that they take place in what he calls the, the world or the sphere or the domain of the variable. And he distinguishes that explicitly from the domain of the eternal. So when he looks at the whole universe, he says there are some things in the universe that will never change. Whether that's the case nowadays is still the question because some change goes really slowly. But for Aristotle, the movement of the planets or the stars in the sky, he would say, there we find something that is eternal, that has always been there and will always be there. And there he says, if, if we can get knowledge of what goes on there, that knowledge will, once it's right, also stay the same. And one problem is that, that many people think, well, that's real knowledge, that the knowledge that is true forever and that tells us about things that will always go in the same way. So there is a little part of reality where maybe that makes sense. But what's brilliant about Aristotle is that he says, well, wait a minute, most of what happens in our lives, most of what matters to us is in the domain of the variable. Now, what's the domain of the variable, the sphere of the variable? That is where we act and where we act with intentions, but where we can never be entirely sure what's going to happen. So we are in the sphere of intentional actions and possible consequences. Baking is in that sphere because even if you follow all the guidelines of the recipe, it can be that when the cake comes out of the oven, it, it, it's not a brilliant cake. And then you try again, or when we work with clay or with, with wood, but of course, also when we interact with other human beings, we have all kinds of intentions. We act, but we can never be sure what's going to happen. So this is already helpful because Aristotle reminds us that in human endeavors like baking and teaching, we cannot talk about cause and effect. We talk about actions, purposeful action, intentional action, and possible consequences. For me, that's another reason why a lot of talk about what works, effectiveness, evidence, misses the point. Because it's things that with lots of research, we move closer to saying these are the, cause, the causes and they will always produce those effects. The most that research says, uh, with the title of a very nice paper from a colleague of mine, he says, it worked here. Will it work there? Well, that's always an open question. So baking and teaching are therefore in the sphere of what you can call the sphere of art, but not art as aesthetic or artistic, but craft and artistry. That's not the domain of what, again, in the terms of Aristotle, he, he would call, or this is kind of a Latin translation of, uh, of Greek, uh, science, or the particular knowledge calls episteme. Art, craft, artistry, getting on in the domain of the variable, require knowledge and, and skill, and always judgment that is situated in, in this particular situation in order to figure out how to act, how to bring something about. Um, following the recipe to bake a cake is fine, but if you find out that the, the flour you have is a different kind of flour, or that the oven isn't hot enough, you need to begin to, to adjust, improvise, judge, and see if you can make it happen. And you always, do that with an eye on the point of the practice. So you should never forget that in making those judgments, in trying to figure out how to move forward, um, that when you're baking, it's the baking that matters. When you're teaching, it's the education that matters. 
Now, the other thing I like about Aristotle, um, and I hope you can still see that this actually is very concrete and very practical, is that teaching is in one respect different from baking. And I just want to highlight that point. So Aristotle would say in the domain of the variable, in our human endeavors, when we try to do something, uh, one thing we do is to make things like baking a cake. You can say these are the productive arts where we aim to make something. And Aristotle has a particular term for that. He calls this the domain of poiesis. And we still have that in poietic and poetry. It's action in order to make something. And for that, we need a particular kind of, of knowledge and capability to know, to judge, to be skillful. And he calls that technique. And of course, there is an, an echo here of technology. Um, but as I said, technology as an open process, not the technicism which sort of things, if we just have the right knowledge, we can get everything under control. Now in the productive arts, uh, working with clay, uh, shipbuilding, saddle making, the examples Aristotle uses, um, baking, but not, I think, three-dimensional printing. Uh, we need a particular kind of knowledge because we are we are trying to make something and you will see that I have underscored the, the thing in some. But that's not the only kind of uh, action we do in the domain of the variable. In addition to the productive arts, there are also what I call here with, with my own words, the interhuman arts, the, the, the social arts, the, the things where we work together in the in the social sphere and there we are not after producing things but you can say we are contributing to to good lives lived well the art of politics is a good example of of that politics ultimately is there in order to help all of us all citizens of a country uh, but hopefully everyone in the world to be able to live their life well. And there you can say education has a similar orientation as an interhuman art. Uh, it is orientated towards the, the good life of our students now and in the future. And the point Aristotle makes here is that he says this is a, a different kind of uh, action the Greek word there is praxis, and in English it has been translated as doing action. So it's not about making something, but about doing something, setting a process in motion. And there Aristotle says, and again, I think he's, he's right, we don't need how knowledge about how to do things, but we need a kind of wisdom in order to judge what the best way of acting is. And this for me highlights the, the difference between baking and teaching, where you can say baking is about the, the production of something, whereas teaching is about contributing to the, the good life, the life lived well of the new generation. So how do these ideas matter for teaching? Um, one thing I would say, and you can probably begin to see a pattern in what I'm trying to say, what I find helpful is to remind ourselves that our work as teachers, as educators, is located in the domain of the variable. And we should be very mindful not to use language that comes from a different domain. So cause and effect, are not the, the right language there, but even to talk about impact can be problematic. The other thing we shouldn't forget that unlike baking, teaching is not about the production of things. So in that sense, teaching is not poiesis. We do not produce our students. We do not produce our children. 
they appear in our lives as parents, as educators, and we educate them. And again, you can say when we begin to talk about learning outcomes, for example, or all kind of other outcomes, before you know it, we are using the language of production. Um, and we are talking about things and that that's not what education is about. So you can say fundamentally, the work we do as teachers is orientated towards this possibility for our students to live their life well, their individual lives, but of course also their collective lives. And therefore, in the terms of Aristotle, teaching is a matter of praxis, of doing action. Now, it is important, again, when you begin to read the literature on this, some people make a very strong distinction and they say teaching is purely praxis and it has nothing to do with poiesis. That's unhelpful because the, the how questions in teaching are tremendously important, tremendously relevant. It's what all teachers constantly ask, how shall I do this? They ask it their colleagues, how have you done it? So you can say the techne of teaching is tremendously important as well, but it can never be all there is in teaching. There is always the, the wider question, I put it here, it needs to be embedded in phronesis, in the, in the practical wisdom, in the questions about what needs to be done. That's where I again think that the language of effectiveness is not very helpful. So we should never ask as teachers what's, what's effective. We should always be asking what is educational because there are things that can be effective. If we give our students money or other rewards, then maybe suddenly their, their performance will, will skyrocket. If we punish them, then maybe we are able to influence their behavior in very effective ways. But we have to agree that in most cases, this is uneducational. This is not wise to do, although it may be effective to do. So here is this important distinction between baking and teaching, you could say. That brings me already to the, the final bit in what I wanted to put on the table. Um, because if the good of teaching, the good of education has to do with this orientation on the, the telos of education, then of course there is the big question, what can we say about the telos, about the point of education, about the purpose of education? One way to answer that question is to say, well, that's about the agendas, the agendas that we give to education as a society, or that the governments give to education out of its responsibility to, to govern a country. Um, and you see an awful lot of that um, around education, in education. Nowadays, maybe also looking particularly at Scotland, we, we hear the importance of social justice, equal opportunities, sustainability. Maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago or in other contexts and settings, we would hear a lot about employability, economic growth, social cohesion. And maybe if you go back 100 years, you would hear about the schools are there for obedience and, and virtue and, and that's it. So one way to engage with this question of the telos of education is to say, let's see if we can agree about some values and then say education, uh, this is what you need to give priority. That, that sounds good, but there is still a worry here, namely that we keep sort of putting all kinds of values and agendas onto education from the outside without asking how proper that is for education. 
And there, the interesting question emerges, could it be that education has its own telos, something that sort of comes from the inside, that's proper to education? In some of my work, I ask this as the question, has education its own integrity? And if that's the case, then we should be careful not to just put any agenda on education, because maybe some agendas go against the, the very point of education. And here I would say very quickly and briefly that I think this orientation towards the possibility for our students to live their own life individually and collectively and live that well, for me that gets quite close to why I think that in education the, the sitting generation put so much effort in, in meeting the new generation. When you then ask what, what does that mean a little bit more concretely, you can say, well, it means that we need to equip our students for their own life. And that is, is one job that we do in education. We provide them with knowledge, skills, and even more so with understanding in order to qualify them to make it possible for them to act to do things that's one thing we need to do but you can say we also have a task there to provide our students with orientation to say this is the world this is how it has come about here are the things we're happy about here are the things we're not so proud about give students a sense of orientation in the broadest way possible, but of course also when we educate bakers, we not just want them to, to have the knowledge and skills and understanding to bake, we also want to introduce them into the whole tradition and, and practice of baking. Is that enough? No. I think what is also at the heart of all education is, to put it in a, in a, in a funny way, Ultimately, as teachers, we want to get rid of our students, uh, not in a bad way, but what we do with our students is always there so that at some point they can leave the school, step into the world and, and lead their own lives there in the best way possible. And you can say the work we do there is to encourage them to be subjects of their own life and not objects of all kinds of forces from the outside. In my own work, I use this strange word subjectification, but with the echo of subject, you can maybe see what I'm after. This for me begins to show how wonderful, but also how complicated our work as teachers is. Because unlike bakers who only need to know how to bake well, Unlike doctors who only need to have an orientation on health, unlike plumbers who only need to know how to plumb well, if, if you can say it in that way, probably not. Um, in education, we always have these three concerns, the qualification, the socialization, and the subjectification. And that gives education a, a threefold telos, you can say. And, the work of, of good education is to keep these three in, in balance. For me, this is a much better way to talk about the point of education, the question of the good of education, than the language I often hear, the language of learning, that just says, what's the work of teachers? Well, it's to, to support students' learning or to encourage students' learning or to measure students' learning. For me, that's a very empty and, and, and one-dimensional language. So again, we're talking about these three domains of purpose, you could say, the threefold point of education. Um, it becomes more precise and more interesting to ask, so what then is the good of education? What is good teaching? Well, in some way it needs to be mindful of and take care of these three important dimensions. That's it. Maybe already too detailed for some, uh, not for others. 
it is a, a provocation in which I've tried to make clear why I want to maintain that teaching is not a moral profession. I find that actually a very strange, misleading claim. And why I've also argued that an ethical teacher is not, not automatically, not necessarily a good teacher. These are two different conversations. Why is that important? I think to, to highlight the importance of the distinction between the ethical dimensions of our work and the normative dimensions of our work. And the ethical, you can say, we share with other professions, other fields of practice, although there are some aspects that are specific for education and teaching. But that is a different conversation from saying teaching itself is a, is a normative profession, not a technical one. Our job is not to produce, our job is to educate, uh, to educate the new generation for their own life. What I like about Scotland and the context in which we're doing this is that Scotland makes this distinction by having professional standards for teaching and the code of professionalism and conduct. And you can say one is the house of the good of teaching and the other is the house of the, the ethics of the profession. So it's helpful in order to, to highlight this distinction, not in order to say if we just put one thing in one box and one in the other box, then it's all sorted. But once we have the distinction, then we can begin to think about what is the relationship between the two? How much of the one does the other need? Um, and I think that's a really important discussion to have also because in the current code of professionalism and conduct, there is quite a lot that I, I think connects strongly to the, the professional standards. Um, and it's, it's a good question for the, the future of the code whether that should be there or not. For me at the moment, it's an open question. What I cannot resist because this is a provocation that maybe when we begin to look into that uh, from the angle of the, the code, uh, we may also want to have another look at the, the current standards and the, the way in which the standards try to articulate the, the good of teaching in order to ask whether the current standards are doing that well or well enough. And if you want to hear more on that, then you need to invite me back for another provocation maybe in the future. So I want to thank you for that. There is much more to read and maybe this sounds a bit or looks a bit silly. Uh, here are the, the covers of five books that I've written over the past 15 years. So it's not that I do a a book every week, but maybe in the titles you can begin to see some of my concerns. Where well, already quite some time ago I argued that this language of learning is not good enough, we need to move beyond that. We actually need to talk about the good of education, which is particularly important in age of measurement, where there is so much measurement that seems to be able to tell us this is good and this isn't good. And I keep saying, no, the measurement cannot tell us that. Um, it's one thing to be critical of learning. It's another to, to see that teaching is not an, an outdated thing of the past, but that there is something really important about teaching that we should not forget and in a sense rediscover. In all of that, and that's the point I also try to make, um, we have to acknowledge that all our wonderful work we do as educators takes place in this domain of the variable. So there is always some risk, some openness, and a lot of that is good because we open the door for our students to the world and they have to step through that door, you could say. And that's a, a wonderful and beautiful risk to take. And that for me also means that the ultimate focus for all our work should not be the child or the student, 
also not the curriculum or the knowledge, bring those two together because we want the new generation to, to step into the world well equipped, well prepared, but ultimately that is where the, the center should be. So don't worry about the content of the books. I tend to think that the, the titles of my books say it all. So maybe this is all further reading you need to do. Thanks very much for your attention. And I hope that this provokes some productive and helpful discussions.